Good morning and welcome to today's hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee. I'm Idani Rodriguez, the chair of the committee. First, let me recognize, as I recognize my colleague here, Councilmember Ku and Constantinides. Today, the committee will be examining, examining the private bus industry in New York City. This industry includes traditional intercity bus companies like Greyhound that operates from the Port Authority bus terminal in Midtown, and locally now they already started serving from George Washington bus terminal in Madison to Philip uh, Baltimore in DC and very soon probably to upstate New York. So we had good companies attending others uh, who offer both services to other cities throughout the region and across the country. There are also many companies who provide similar service but make stops right on the street of the city using the curb instead of traditional bus stations, which often, which often offer low-cost tickets. There are also charter buses that individuals and groups hire to, for customized trips to a wide variety of destinations throughout the city and beyond. Corpside intercity buses from so-called Chinatown buses to big players such as Mega Bus and Bolt Bus can be a great option for New Yorkers and visitors alike for convenient transportation to other cities at a reasonable cost. However, we are also well aware that as these services have become more popular in recent years, they have sometimes generated congestions, pollution, and safety concerns from local communities where these buses tend to operate most. And we live in like an epidemic. Every three or four years, there's a crash where many New Yorkers are losing their life in Bobbin Song on those buses. The city must recognize the real burden and disruption that large numbers of these buses constantly coming and going can create for the residents and local businesses of these neighborhoods. These concerns led to the creation of the intercity bus permit system in 2012. We look forward to hearing from the Department of Transportation today about the success and challenges they have encountered as they have implemented this, this new system. We want to hear from the administration, from the bus industry, from the advocate, and from local residents about the extent to which the permit system has achieved its stated goals of mitigating the destructive impact to that too many buses using our streets and sidewalks can have in giving local communities more of a voice in deciding where these bus stops are located. We also recognize that there are other types of bus services, such as buses that run between the city and area casinos that in some ways operate like curbside intercity buses and in other ways resemble charter operations, which some which, and I'm sorry, with some having the added application of never actually leaving the city limits, such as those buses that serve the casino at Aqueduct. Dot. We hope to find out more about the regulatory framework governing these bus, buses today. The safety of this industry is, of course, a top concern for everyone. There have been too many tragic crashes involving private buses in our city. On September 18th in Flushing, Queens, a private bus collided with an MTA bus, killing three great New Yorkers, including the drivers of the private and bus and injury assisting others. And of course, we all remember the horrific crash in 2011 in the Bronx that killed 15 people. But these are just two examples of some things that happens far too often on our street. Although we know that the administration cannot discuss in details the crash in Flushing because it is the subject of ongoing investigation, we do hope to learn more about ways in which the city 
can take action to make this industry safer and protect the writing public. We also know that this is an industry, an industry in which regula regulation and oversight are largely in the hands of the federal and state governments. For the most part, outside of the scope of this hearing, I would like to footnote that these safety concerns extend to tour and sight seeing buses in the city. That is also something we must pay attention to. As elected officials who represent the people of the city and as the agency that serve them, it is our responsibility to stand up for the people of the city, shine a light on where the problems are, and then work together with our colleagues at the state and federal level, as well as our partners in the industry itself, to come up with meaningful solutions. We know the city, state, and the federal governments have established rules and regulations and rating tools to access the safety of these companies operating on our roads. But how can we strengthen current rules and regulations and further enforce them? I'm calling for a charter bus enforcement unit dedicated to making sure the companies abide by the law. They will ensure their drivers are registered with the DMV monitor rules for a speed violation and all the laws and regulation. Today, I'm also calling for drivers and companies in areas not authorized to be fined up to $10,000 in New York City. I would like to welcome the members of the administration who are here with us today. Thank you for being here. I look forward to hearing from, our, from you about how the city is approaching this important issue. We also welcome and look forward to hearing from the representatives of the industry, advocates, and members of the public about their ideas for improving the way in which this industry operates in our city. I would like to also welcome Councilmember Chen and now give Councilmember Ku the opportunity also to say a few words since the last crash happened in his district. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you for the administration to come here to testify. Uh, I want to start by saying there's a place for the charter bus industry. It is popular service is a popular service that brings visitors, workers, and tourists to and from my district. And my district is one of the most busy districts uh, in terms of transportation. So we have more than like 24 buses and, and in downtown area. We then have Long Railroad, we, did, we have the seven train, we have all these taxi and uh, uh, driving around. Uh. So that said, uh, my district has also experienced uh, serious problems with the charter bus industry for years. In general, they come and go as they please, causing, tra uh, causing traffic congestion and safety issues with little consequence. Uh, the mixed federal state and local jurisdiction has made it difficult to enforce and regulate and lightly made it possible for them to operate so freely. For example, <coughs> I personally saw a casino bus parked in a newly created uh, bus-only lane on Main Street. Uh, it has an A-frame advertisement uh, right in front of the, uh, the door on the sidewalk. I watched a traffic agent approach the bus, uh, write the ticket, look at the driver, <coughs> and walk away. The whole time, the bus driver was reclining in the driver's seat waiting for customers. He had his feet kicked up on the steering wheel, and he was watching the ticket agent give him the ticket, but he couldn't care less. You know? It was a cause of doing business. Last month's accident highlights the most serious problems of safety in the industry, and we are here today to explore how the private bus industry can be better regulated and to see how we can pre prevent such devastating crashes from happening again. Thank you. Thank you. I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite the administration to deliver the testimony.
Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Alex Keating, Director of Special Projects for Transportation Planning and Management at DOT. I'm joined today by DOT's Deputy Manhattan Borough Commissioner Ed Pinkar and Assistant General Counsel Hannah Roth. We are also joined today by Inspector Scott Hanover of the NYPD's Transportation Bureau, Bob Barrows, Managing Attorney of the NYPD's Legislative Affairs Unit, and New York City Sheriff Joseph Fusito. Thank you for inviting us on behalf of Mayor de Blasio and our respective commissioners to discuss the private bus industry. Private buses of all kinds play an important role in New York City's transportation system. They bring numerous visitors and commuters a year to our city, fueling our economy. At the same time, they're an effective choice for out-of-town transportation for many New Yorkers. Additionally, certain types of private buses complement other transportation options for various trips within the city itself. Buses are a space-efficient travel mode, transportation, transporting far larger numbers of people than private cars on our finite street space. As our entire transportation network nears the limits of its capacity, DOT has a strong interest in promoting the most space-efficient travel modes. Safety is our top priority, a recent, and recent high-profile bus crashes are concerning. With the Vision Zero goal of eliminating traffic deaths and serious inju injuries for all street users, pedestrians, cyclists, occupants of vehicles, including buses, DOT is continually working to improve street design and traffic rules. Consistent public education programming and enforcement efforts undertaken in partnership with the NYPD are also critical. As you know, many aspects of the bus industry, including driver licensing, equipment, and operations are highly regulated by the state and federal governments. The city's role in regulating the private bus industry is primarily related to authorizing curbside bus stop locations, as well as promulgating traffic rules and posted regulations that buses and other vehicles must follow. Additionally, sightseeing buses, which operate entirely within city limits, are subject to DCA licensing requirements. Buses are defined by federal, state, and local laws in slightly different ways, but generally any vehicle seating more than 15 passengers is considered a bus. First, there are three types of buses that operate between New York City and locations outside of the city. Intercity, public transportation, and charter buses. For bus stop permit purposes, intercity buses are defined as buses that travel between New York City and anywhere outside the city on regularly scheduled service. However, this does not include buses operated by public authorities or by any county, city, or town, either directly or through a contract. In order to load and unload at the curb, inner city buses are required to utilize designated stops, as well as have and prominently display a DOT bus stop permit, which I'll discuss in great, greater detail in a moment. In contrast, charter buses are hired by a private person or group under a contract to travel to a set location or locations and are not required to utilize designated stops. Inner city buses and charter buses can be hard to tell apart from their appearance or destinations alone without more information about the specifics of their service. Finally, there are a few types of buses that travel among destinations exclusively within the city, including sightseeing buses, franchise buses, and free shuttle buses. Three entities are primarily responsible for regulating bus operations. The United States Department of Transportation, the Motor Carrier Safety Administration within the US DOT, and, the, and state DOTs, such as New York State DOT. Each entity has a, a series of regulatory requirements, including limitations on driver licensing, hours a driver may operate a vehicle, and regulations on the bus equipment. To enforce these requirements, they require logs and reporting and conduct inspections for safety and compliance. Federal law broadly preempts the state and city's authority to regulate bus schedules, routes and rates, or any operator's authority to provide charter bus transportation. Because of this legal framework and the nature of bus operations, cities must rely on the state and federal authorities to regulate many aspects of the industry. 
Locally, DOT has the responsibility to manage curb access on New York City streets, including designating official bus stops. Providing curb space for inner city buses has been a challenge as the sector of the bus industry has grown dramatically over the past decades. In 2012, New York City worked with state representatives to add section 1642A to the New York Vehicle and Traffic Law, which gives the city authority to issue on-street bus stop permits to intercity buses and to issue significant fines for non-compliance with those rules. As described in the law and the city's rules, DOT issues bus stop permits on the basis of traffic flow, pedestrian flow, and safety. The bus stop permit program has helped DOT address some persistent community concerns about this class of bus loading and in locations detrimental to the health and safety of city residents. However, the law does not give the city authority to regulate driver licensing or any other aspect of inner city bus operations, elements which are appropriately regulated at the state and federal levels. For most, types of, for most other types of buses, even though they are not covered by the inner city bus stop law, DOT's traffic rules, specifically section 4-10C, prohibit bus operators from picking up or dropping off passengers on a street except at a bus stop designated by the commissioner. Charter buses are an exception to this rule. Regarding bus routes, franchise buses are the only private buses in New York City that must follow designated routes. All other buses, section, for all other buses, section 4-10E of DOT's traffic rules requires empty buses and buses that do not have specifically designated routes to stay on truck routes, except to arrive and depart from their destination. Also at the local level, DOT's traffic and highway rules apply to all buses, as does New York State's vehicle and traffic law. And NYPD enforces those laws, including speed limits, parking, stopping and standing regulations, idling, and general traffic regulations, including failure to yield. Under the command of Chief of Transportation Thomas Chan, the NYPD has dedicated personnel trained on developing and implementing strategies to expedite the movement of buses and to enforce laws and regulations related to the operation of buses in the city. NYPD personnel enforce traffic regulations in and around bus stops and bus lanes and respond to complaints from the public concerning traffic safety issues related to buses. Year to date, personnel from the NYPD Transportation Bureau have written nearly 2,000 moving summonses that are attributed to buses and NYPD personnel have issued over 22,000 parking summonses that are attributed to buses, up 34% from last year. New York, the New York City Department of Finance and the New York City Sheriff also play a crucial role in enforcement. Once violations are in judgment, the sheriff can seize vehicles or business proceeds to satisfy unpaid judgments. Finally, DOT is committed to working more closely with the bus industry to provide drivers, especially drivers coming from out of the state, with all of the information they need to drive safely and legally within the five boroughs. We are currently revising our printed materials to clarify the rules of the road here in the city with special focus on truck routes, permitted layover areas, and idling limits. We also plan to hold a series of webinars with bus companies in the near future to explain these laws in greater detail. We appreciate the willingness of the bus industry to collaborate with us on this effort and the leadership of Council Member Johnson in bringing the parties to the table. DOT would welcome opportunities to partner with additional Council Members in this effort. Thank you for the opportunity to testif testify before you today. We are now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions. I know that my colleague also they will have other questions. Uh, let me also give, I may give the opportunity to Council Member Kuh, he also had to go to another hearing. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. So I want to know is, uh, how is it possible for someone with such a poor driving record to be allowed to get behind the wheel? And do you think the private charter uh, industry should be subjected to the same safety standards as MTA or school buses? 
Uh, drivers, uh, the driver was fired from MTA for DUI, but still able to drive a private bus. So uh, uh, inter and intra buses held to different safety standards. Uh, please describe. So safety is our top priority, and, and these uh, crashes are very concerning. Um, as discussed in the testimony, given the city's role in regulating the, the bus industry, uh, we can look at the whether folks are obeying the posted traffic regulations and using the bus stop permitted spaces correctly, all other uh, aspects of driver licensing and operations and inspections fall to the state and federal level. So what are the penalties for inter and intercity buses making a nice uh, stop? Uh, so I'll, t I'll turn that over to a colleague. Can you repeat the question? What are the penalties? Oh, what are the penalties? Intercity buses making a nice stop. So the penalties for violating any of the inner city bus stop permit rules are $500 mm -hmm. uh, for an offense. And the other kinds of violations that these buses will receive are, are parking or traffic tickets. So a, a normal parking ticket is often $115. Why, why are city uh, inter city bus stops listed on the DOT website below intra city? Resolved Wells has at least six buses traveling to Fortune that the city doesn't seem to know or care about. Yeah. Why? Uh, I'm unaware of the exact service that you're mentioning. All buses that are utilizing dedicated curb space to pick up and drop off should have a should have permission to do so and should be listed on our website. I believe, or no? The inner, the, all of the inner city bus stops are listed on the <laughs> website, and we um, at DOT do have information on where all of the bus stops that are utilized by any type of bus are located. We, we uh, can certainly look at adding additional information to our website and discuss it further. Okay, yeah. So, so Dahlia, the, the company that has a crash uh, last time, uh, the, the, the company wasn't listed in the DOT website. Uh, how do we stop these companies from operating illegally? Uh, who is in charge of enforcing them? Does the city coordinate with state or federal enforcement agencies? These are the three questions I have. Uh, so just to start, obviously, uh, given the ongoing investigation, we won't be discussing anything specific to that incident. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues from PD to discuss the broader uh, enforcement issues you brought up. Uh, we enforce, we, I have the bus unit. I'm in command of and what we do is we support the precincts throughout the city and we uh, provide them backup and assistance in enforcing bus regulations. So we go out into different locations where we receive community complaints or observations by us, feedback from council members, feedback from precincts, and we go to those locations and we'll inspect the buses to ensure that they have the proper paperwork also, I have a truck unit. They'll do a rudimentary inspection on the bus to ensure that it's safe to operate. If it's not safe, we do have the ability to take it out of service, force the company to tow it away, which is quite a significant financial hit. Plus, we also issued them criminal court summonses returnable to the local borough criminal court. So does DOT uh, communicate with NYPD, NYPD which buses are licensed to stop, or is, is it just up to the NYPD to the chat themselves? We communicate all the time. Uh, their website is excellent, but we communicate on a daily, not a daily basis, but we c communicate quite often in regards to intercity buses, charter buses, hop-on, hop-off buses, they give us their issues with complaints that they received. And if we have a complaint about a particular bus company that may be violating laws on a regular basis, we provide that information to them. Okay, yes, well, I have a few more questions. So um, does DOT check with state or federal government before issuing permits? Are there background checks for drivers or companies? So uh, if, 
any, any company that is applying for an inner city bus stop permit has to include information that they are licensed and that they have insurance. Um, we, we do check that, but that's all sort of included at the state and uh, level in terms of actually overseeing that, that process of issuing the, the insurance and such. But, but you don't check the drivers, right? Yeah. Not the individual drivers, no. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the DOT is undergoing a smart truck management plan uh, to, coordinate, to coordinate deliveries throughout the city. Uh, are buses also being considered? Um, currently, that, that program is focused specifically on commercial delivery activity at the curb, um, so buses would not fall under that. But of course, as we mentioned in the testimony, a bus that is utilizing our streets outside of the franchise does need to be on dedicated truck routes at all times unless it's making its pickup or, or drop off. So my last question is, uh, why is Lower Manhattan the only area the city has a specified bus map? Uh, what was involved uh, in crafting it and could one be created for other parts of the city, uh, namely Flushing, which is already a transportation hub with over 20 bus lines. Councilmember, good morning. I wasn't here, as the Councilmember Chin knows, while that part of the map was created, but I understand it was due to the bus issues related to the World Trade Center site and the 9-11 memorial. We're certainly happy to work with you uh, and your colleagues if there are other areas that need to be called out. Okay, that's good, yeah. That's it. I think that we have to do better. I believe that we are showing that we're weak when it comes to enforcement in New York City. It, well, I understand all the limitations we have, but I believe that with, them, with the tools we have, we should be able to make the back actors accountable. I believe that, you know, as many hard workers, drivers and company, and they provide services, sometimes uh, efficiency and safe, but it's like an epidemic, like it's like every three, four years. And the consequences is like a three individuals being killed in his district. A few years ago, there was 15. How many bus stop, how many drivers were stopped last year by the NYPD? Uh, how many drivers were stopped? I yeah. wouldn't have that information. How many, can you share, me, share some data? Like, when it comes to enforcement, give me something that I, can, that I can say, I can share with my colleague. This is how much we are doing on enforcement. Uh, Chief Chan, Chief of Transportation, uh, for 2018, under the guise of Vision Zero, we are going to focus on bus and truck violations. And that's one of our goals coming down in the future. Uh, already what I've done is I've changed the mission statement of our bus unit they're going to concentrate solely on bus violations. In the past, they've also addressed bus lane violations and traffic flow. I've transferred that responsibility over to a different unit within my command so the bus unit can concentrate on bus violations committed by the bus drivers themselves. I have a lot of respect in Chief China being a partner as you guys when it comes to Vision Zero. Uh, but I would like to know how frequently are private buses stop in New York City because of traffic infractions. Uh, what violations are the most co uh, commonly that those drivers are getting? Let's look about last year. And please, if we don't have the number, you say we don't have it because sometimes we go around and say, you know, going around. I would like to know Again, the question is how frequently are private buses stopped by the NYPD? Well, I, I think, so my name is Bob Maros, I'm from the NYPD. Um, I think to look at, at data for moving violations year to date, we, the, the bus unit has written 2,000 moving summonses, which is up significantly from the 2,000? 2,000, In yes. last year? Over, a little bit over 2,000. No, this is year to date. Uh, from last 17 to 18. No, from January 1st, 2017 okay. to October 23rd, 2017, year-to-date numbers. To private bus driver? To all buses. 
moving silent. No, can you can yes, you private bus drivers? Can can you yeah. give me the breakdown? Of who are those buses? You suppose you know if you had the two thousand, I heard that you had the breakdown. There to all private bus drivers. They could be intercity bus drivers. They could be charter bus drivers. To a but bus can, drivers. Can give me something. This is about a crisis day where people, three people die. What is the breakdown that you have that you can share? How many of those were in charter buses? I, we don't keep stats based on particular bus classes. We just overall, how many we've written to private bus drivers. But you just said right now that that includes charter buses and other buses, right? Yes, sir. It doesn't happen up the air. You have those information. The, the 2,000 moving violations include all classes of buses. So it's written to the conveyance, not the, you know, this is a charter bus, this is an inner city bus. Um, if we would need to do a, a, a deeper dive into the data to see which, you know, which type of bus it is, we write the summons to the bus. You can make that change, right? In the form, in whatever, electronic or paper format, you know, the member of the NYPD use right. to be able to identify if those buses are charters, if they are not charters, you can do that, right? We would have, so, th so the number that I have today is just total bus summonses. Okay. Um, I would have to get back to you on whether we can break it down further by, you know, what type of bus it is. Okay. And what is a common violation of those 2,000? Uh, the common violations for the movers would be uh, we don't get many speeding violations. A lot of times what we get is spillback, uh, failure to yield to pedestrians in crosswalks, red lights, um, illegal turns, disobeying signs, disobeying pavement markings, things of that nature. Do you also give tickets for those who do pick up and drop out in area that they are not authorized? That would be a parking violation. How that often are those tickets given to those? How many parkers are we writing? So year to date, NYPD personnel and the Transportation Bureau have written uh, a little bit over 22,000 parking violations. What about buses? Two buses, yes, two buses. 22,000, two buses. 22,000? Yes. What do you have any, or can you share with us, like, what percentage are for those uh, drivers who pick up and drop out in non authorized area? So, so the number, again, is, is the aggregate of all types of different summonses that have been issued to buses. So I would have to get back to you on a breakdown of each specific offense. That's just the total parking summonses that have been issued to buses. That's, that's important. Yes. And I know that we have the same interest. Right. Like we need to, you know, deal with this epidemic. And yeah. I think that, again, we don't control mm -hmm. a lot of things that is happening from the Fed and the state level. Right. But at least with the enforcement in areas that, that they are not supposed to be allowed, I think that that's where we can control. And, and council member, I would just like to add to, the, to, to, to your inquiry that, you know, the 22,000 parking violations that are issued and the 2,000 moving violations that have been issued to buses, that doesn't necessarily represent the entire gamut of enforcement. Many times, you know, we could be issuing, our personnel could be pulling somebody over and giving them a warning. Or in some cases, like with idling, a TEA will approach the, the driver who's in the car at the moment and say, please turn off your vehicle, and we get compliance that way as well. Are buses allowed, or drivers, or buses drive allowed to drive through the Hobson River Drive? To the best of my knowledge, no. How much do you enforce that? <clears throat> that would be the highway division would enforce that. I drive every day through that area. And you are, you are There's district. buses every day using that area. I'm not absolutely positive that they cannot use the buses on that highway. I would have to find out. I'm almost sure that in some area, because I know that we're dealing <clears throat> with the, at the city level, that there's some area that buses are allowing or they're not. However, if we look from 34th Street, all the way to Dagman Street, George Washington uh, Bridge, there's buses going there every day. And, and, and to be clear, those are not only charter buses. That also include many of the buses' company. 
And I think that I'm calling also to the good one that are already here to be sure that, that they also make their drivers accountable not to drive in area that they know are allowed to yet to cut traffic to get into the George Washington Bridge. I will find out whether that is a violation and I will notify the high, highway district. Okay. I want to just add on, I think that's a great point and it speaks to how important education is as well. Um, the, the truck routes are posted on our website and available and getting them into the hands of all of the drivers, all of the companies is important and under making sure that everyone at the table is aware of where these buses should and should not be. Uh, it also speaks to the, to the complexity of the issue when a bus can be making a pickup or a drop off, the final bit of its uh, either origin or destination does not need to be on a, a, a truck route. So it, it adds some complexity to what our, our colleagues at PD have to do, but it's, it's clearly marked and available on our, our website. Okay. And, and again, I, I'm for, we, we, my colleague, were able to get $5 million for the education initiative for Vision Zero. And for me, this is Vision Zero. But I think that this is more than educational. Those companies, those drivers, they know that they're not supposed to be driving. And I just bring the Hobson River Drive as one that I know. I'm pretty sure that that's the same situation in each of the colleges. It's about drivers trying to cut traffic. And I think this is about, besides education enforcement, is like one of the key uh, uh, elements there. My last question, I have many other, but my colleague also has questions, is on, right now, I also was reading on the DOT website on the consequences for drivers who doesn't, who pick up and drop out in no authorized area. I think it's go up to $3,000, I don't recall the maximum amount. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll turn that over to my colleague. Yes, yeah, so there, um, for summonses that are issued to OATH or the envir formerly the Environmental Control Board, the second violation can be up to $2,500. And this is something that we can legislate, right? This is something that the city, because DOT, DOT made it by rule, right? They stay allowed to do it, so we can legislate that one, too. It's authorized by the state law. The, the penalties are set forth in the state law, and they are duplicated in our city rules. Can we increase that, that amount? Up to the limits of the state law, but beyond that, we're limited by the state law. Okay, because I know that working together also with Chief Chan and YPD in the administration, we increase the penalty for those drivers who leave the scene in the hidden run up to $10,000 because that's the maximum that we are allowed to. So I'm looking to work with you guys in the administration and my colleagues with a potential legislation to increase to the maximum that they stay will allow to increase those penalties. And I believe that those penalties should be going to the drivers and to the company. Councilmember, that's a fine suggestion, no pun intended, and we'll be happy to take it back to the leadership at DOT. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now I have Councilmember. Uh, uh, we joined by Councilmember Rich and Councilmember Menchaca. Now we have Councilmember Chin that has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, First, I wanted to um, thank DOT and NYPD for working with us in Lower Manhattan uh, on our intercity um, task force, uh, intercity bus task force. We've been dealing with this issue for many, many years now. Um, we thought we got a handle on it when we fought for the permitting system, and we got some, um, the private bus company to work with us, and we were beginning to identify who some of these companies are, and when the permit system started, people, we encouraged them to come in and apply, and we thought it was going well. Now it's still like the wild, wild west. All of a sudden, there are a lot of these bus companies that are either one bus or two bus, and they are just not following the rules again, and this is the intercity bus part. I know that in uh, the town hall meeting that we had um, with the mayor, um, one of the constituents raised the question about one company um, just rented the little parking lot right next to uh, their storefront, and a bus would go in and out of there. And there are time two buses are parking there. And I've seen when the bus pulled out, it just blocked the whole street. Now. NYPD, I guess my question is, is that legal for them to utilize a parking lot as a bus stop for 
drop off and pick up? Uh, I can't speak about the inside of the parking lot, but if the person's blocking the sidewalk, that's obviously a violation that we would address. As far as being able to use it almost as like a bus depot inside that empty lot, I don't know what regulations that would cover. I mean, what about also the idling room? Because when they're in there, oftentimes the engine is running and you have people living right in the back of it, you know? There's a building, there's a residential building right there in the back of the, of the lot and people are smelling the fumes. Yeah, uh, so obviously uh, regarding the inner city bus stop permits from DOT's perspective, we're dealing with on-street parking uh, and, and stops for these buses. I think that it's a very good point that the idling should be uh, enforced regardless. So that's something that we could work with NYPD um, for uh, at least the resident to be able to call 311 or, or the NYPD um, precinct. Uh, 311 or the precinct. And then the precinct would address it. If they needed help from us, we would go ahead. we go down there and help them. We're down there quite often. And then the other issue is that what it came up in, in the task force meeting was suggestion to really help NYPD have more information. I mean, one of the, the issues that came up at, at one of the meetings that we had this week was like, for officers to know exactly what that permit looked like, uh, because one of the issues is that there are buses that are, you know, using fake permits, That's, right? So NYPD officer, if they know exactly what the permit looks like, um, then they can check uh, on the bus. Um, that's one thing. Another suggestion uh, that I think the NYPD, uh, the precinct was asking for was that, was it possible to really post on the bus stop um, the company that, that is entitled to stop there and also their schedule. So they know that, hey, if there is no one scheduled to do drop off and pick up at 12 o'clock and you have a bus park there, um, because there are other bus companies that are using the same stop, that don't have the permit, but they're using the stops. Uh, so in order for the police officer to know exactly which one is violating the rules, if a schedule somehow is posted um, at the stop. That also would be helpful. I think that's a, a good suggestion. And obviously the schedules are posted on our website and the buses are required to have them on hand as well. Uh, but we can look into what you're discussing. And my, one last question um, relating to what also Councilmember Ku talked about. Um, casino bus. Some casino bus company got smart and went and applied for intercity permits. Um, and the owner were, you know, saying that they paid a lot of money and now they got the permit. And the, and the sign is on there. This is the one on Chatham Square uh, in Chinatown. So the signs are up there for these companies. And these are tour companies, whatever. But objectively, if there are casino bus that are using that bus stop. And I mean, this is the one that I guess they're paying these tour company, whoever they are that were, that got around the system and got to stop. And they're doing a great business because their time, I see more than one casino bus parked there. Um, and at the same time, we have other casino bus that park wherever they want, right? So it is, it is a lot of burden on NYPD to have to keep, you know, coming and, and giving ticket, and ticket is a cost of doing business. It really doesn't serve the purpose, because they still keep coming back. Unless we tow the bus, right? Take it out of service, that will hit them harder. But the casino bus, I mean, you see the sign on the side <laughs> where they're taking them to, and they're not into the city bus, and so they figure a way to do that. And that is something that we really have to uh, not be outsmart by them. We really have to figure a way of enforcing them to follow the rule. Because yes, they could just stop at a bus stop because they could consider a commuter bus, but you have to stop at a bus stop, right? Okay, because in your testimony said that they allow to do that, but they don't do that. I mean, they park in the middle of the street and they're oftentimes they double park. Come on, you know, you could just 
legally you could go park in front of a bus stop for five minutes, but they don't do that. So I think that is something that we are asking for more enforcement and a way to sort of let these companies know, look, these are the rules. If you don't follow the rules, there are consequences. And it's not just increasing the fine, that's one step. But I think we really need to seriously look at towing the bus um, to make them pay, all right? Councilmember, first of all, thank you as always for your continued partnership on this and other issues. Um, some casino buses can be approved through the existing inner city bus law uh, to operate with a bus stop. So as a first step, we should identify whether those buses have a permit or not. And then if they don't, we are happy to work with you and NYPD to target enforcement. How do you consider them as intercity bus when they pick up a passenger and they drop them off in front of the casino? It's not that they're dropping off uh, them in Connecticut, uh, uh, a street on Connecticut, but it's right in front of the casino. I mean, how did they skirt the rules? <laughs> well, I guess it would depend on where the casino is, but if there is a, you know, out-of-state casino or out-of-city casino, um, and they have regular service, then the state law would require them to classify as an inner-city bus. Um, and that's just how the law is written because of the charge. And I just, I think this speaks again to this this is a really complicated problem, and I do think the way that these different kinds of buses are defined makes it a little hard to tell them apart when just looking at them. And it, it, as Alex said in his testimony, it goes beyond often what the physical bus looks like, um, and it is about the destination and the type of service. So we're happy to you know, look at any particular spot that you all have identified. But I think uh, what I would request, Chair, is that we also want some suggestion from you. How do we get the federal government, I mean, what, what should we do to advocate on the federal level, state level? Um, because um, at the task force meeting, right, uh, the sheriff was there. Most of these bus are registered in another state. They're not registered in our state. But they come in here and they cause a lot of havoc in our community. So we have to look at this thing nationally on, on a federal level. How do we control that or regulate that? Because I was like surprised, none of the bus company will register in New York State. So that is not good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rich has a question, but I, before he has a question, I want to interject with this question on what can be the consequences for company that use another company permit? So uh, an inner city bus permit is issued to a specific company, the one who applies, and no other company's buses should be utilizing that, that pick-up or drop-off location. That would be a ticketable offense, and, and whenever we are aware of that, PD is, is out enforcing. But is there a consequence, like, can, can, can a company lose that permit if they allow another company to use the permit without DOT authorization. So maybe Hannah can speak to the specifics. So are in the criteria for revoking or denying a permit are laid out in our rule, which is um, in 4-10 of DOT's traffic rules. And in those rules, a couple of the ways that they can lose their permit is by violating uh, the inner city bus stop permit rules. So if the company has an adjudicated violation of the inner city bus stop rules, a certain number of them, or if they're in arrears to the city of New York, those things we can take in con into consideration. I just when think that, again, this is like, this is our time. And, and as you are aware, there's like one of the main TV stations that they are doing the investigation report on that particular company that they were using a permit of another company. And I think that we have to give a sample. We need to show that we have zero tolerance. I mean, enforcement is a key issue. Like, as I say, we don't have the power of those regulations established by the federal or the state. But when it comes to enforcement, there's much more that we can do. Councilman Richard. Thank you, and thank you, Chair, uh, for holding this important hearing. Uh, I wanted to touch on truck traffic a little bit, because this is the issue of the day in Southeast Queens. And I know the police commissioner had committed to a certain amount of additional boots to Southeast Queens. So I wanted to know where we're at with uh, the additional boots for the police department to boot 
a lot of these trucks. And you spoke of a special uh, enforcement wing in, in the department that deals with trucks. So can you speak to a little bit about what uh, the resources are in that particular de uh, department? And, uh, and one thing I've said to the police commissioner, being that we're so close to the airport, we have JFK, uh, so it, trucks really impact not just my district with Councilmember Miller, and soon to be Councilmember Adrian Adams' district. So I'm interested in knowing, is the NYPD open to having additional units out in Southeast Queens to deal with this issue? The mayor's heard it at the town hall last week again. He's heard it at my town hall. Every town hall he goes to, uh, he seems to hear about this issue. Uh, but we have not seen the level uh, of enforcement that, you know, we believe is suitable to really addressing the truck issue in Southeast Queens. Hey. Uh, good morning. I'm Inspector morning. Fulton. I work for Chief Chan in the Transportation Bureau. So we have uh, bought more boots. Sorry. And, sir, can you please identify yourself for the record? Oh, yeah. Restate your name for the record. Uh, Inspector Dennis Fulton. And I do. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we did uh, purchase more boots, and we are very aware of uh, uh, Southern Queens of, and some of the uh, truck traffic and the, uh, the, uh, the, the unlicensed commuter vans. Um, I know that the commanding officers have worked with uh, Councilman Miller and yourself, and uh, so it, we also have, like uh, Scott, Inspector Hanover, if the precincts need help, he will send his people over to do operations with TLC, but we did get the boots that you uh, referred to. And can you just speak to, so you have units specifically, I think I heard you say that, do you have That's, units dedicated to this issue? De so what do those units look like? How many people are in them? And it's not just about the boots. It's really about being able to have the heavy duty tow, 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 uh, tow trucks to actually tow these so, um, particular uh, right. Vehicles. So our traffic enforcement district is composed of uh, 3,000 traffic agents, and uh, of these we have level uh, uh, three traffic agents who are specifically assigned to operate our tow trucks. So we have some heavy-duty tow trucks that come How over. many? I, I can get you that number. I don't have the exact number. All righty. So I probably know the answer to this because my and let me not blow my uh, precinct up, um, but they do not have enough <laughs> um, uh, resources in this area. And this has been a continuous issue. I mean, I've been at the council going on 15 years now. Every year, the same issue um, keeps coming up and JFK is obviously becoming busier and busier, um, the cargo area. So when can we anticipate on having a specific unit committed to Southeast Queens uh, to deal with this issue. I know the issue is buses, you know, today, um, but for us it's trucks. <laughs> so is there, and we could have this conversation offline, but I, I just would love to see a commitment by PD, NYPD on this issue. Not to say you're not, I think the commanding officers are doing as much as they can and they send us the notifications when they do actions. But since the in issue is, is, is so grand in Southeast Queens, why don't we figure a way to put together a specific unit get that can just deal with this issue or enhance resources there. Look, and if you want to talk offline, it's fine. You don't have to commit we, now. We, we have like a citywide unit that's... We that don't need a citywide unit. We need a specific unit for Southeast Queens. Okay, we, we can discuss that. Yeah. Point. yeah. <laughs> citywide is not working out as consistently. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we were joined by Councilmember Reynoso, now Councilmember Bakatu. Uh, so, I, since my colleague, I don't have any more questions. I would like to, if it's possible, can you show me the area in the Hope, uh, since you say that you have it there, which is the area in the map in the Hobson River Drive that we're not supposed to be having buses there?
to be, we need your support. You know that there's buses going through the Hobson River Drive, right? Uh, could you repeat that again, sir? You know that there's buses going along every day through the Hobson River Drive. I did not know that, uh, and I guess we found out that they're not allowed to do that. Okay. I will notify our highway division to make sure that they're enforcing that. Okay, and again, like, first of all, thank you for, you know, this is the information that, you know, is important for us to have. And we are, again, we are in the same business. Mayor is leading the Vision Zero. Chief Chani, we're working together very close. You know, he are dealing with, you know, hit and run. This is another area that I know that it is important. All I'm saying is about all, the only thing that a reporter got to do, media or newspaper, stand around 72nd Street and count the number of buses going through that area. And as I said, this is only one particular corridor that I know. I'm pretty sure that when we look at the same map through the, all, the whole city, there's going to be all the areas. So for me, this is about if there's anyone here who are representatives sitting in the audience for the charter buses, we applaud and congratulate you know, that you are hiring working class driver, that you are providing good services. We are here to support the good one. But those that they are, and I'm not going to be mentioning, and I, I can tell you that I have a photo in my cell phone of, of, of those bosses because when I'm in the highway, I, this is something I've been looking at. It. So I'm not going to be mentioning because some of those drivers belong to company that in average they are good one. So what I'm calling is for those companies to please do the educational, make your drivers accountable, and for we together, in this case NYPD, you know, let's get, I know that we have limited resources. We are asking for so much in different areas. And I know that we need to, at some point, talking about increasing the funding so that you can have the largest numbers of men and women, you know, in the NYPD dedicated to investigate those cases. So that, which is my proposal. I believe that, you know, under Give Familiar, the city is stopped having an investigation unit. I think that we have to bring that investigation unit back to the city, focusing not only on those charter buses, but in other areas that is important for us to investigate those, you know, bad actors in, that we have in our street. If any of my colleagues has questions, then let's I, I just have a, a comment. Um, recently, um, I want to thank DOT, the commissioner, Commissioner Trottenberg, um, and, and also the, our Manhattan uh, Commissioner Sanchez was with me and my staff. We were standing on Hudson Street and Lake Street. And the commuter bus that you know, came in the morning, dropped workers off, they went back over to Jersey side. And then in the afternoon, they come back to pick people up. And they were not supposed to do that exit um, that's coming off the tunnel on Lake Street. There were signs further up. So right now, I think we're trying to get um, the Jer you know, New York, New York, New Jersey uh, Port Authority to get them to also help with the enforcement. There are signs telling them not to come this way, but they still come this way. We're standing there. We were counting. How many bus? came out and they go down Lake Street and they block the traffic on Hudson, um, blocking the box. They're not following the rules. So there is something that we also need to work with uh, our partners on the other side of the river to sort of manage you know, the commuter bus that's, that's coming back into the city. Uh, I know that's a bit an issue and it's been complained about several times. I know the first precinct does a lot of enforcement there. We don't have I enough, think, uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, resources. I, I think one of the issues, too, and I think you hit it right on the head when you said uh, a little assistance from the Port Authority, uh, when buses are in that right-hand lane, for them to make the, if they see that last sign right there that says you can't go to White Street, it's kind of dangerous for them to go and exit off the other exit. So I think you might be heading in the right direction as far as we need the Port Authority to do some kind of signage or maybe forbid buses and trucks from being in the right-hand lane of the tunnel. So I think you're, you're going in the right direction there. Well, that's, that's what the commissioner also kind of suggested to us, that we need to get them, uh, and we're working on that. Thank you. 
Okay. Councilmember Ku. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, since you guys are here, I might as well ask you this question, too. Yeah. In my area, we have too many, like, uh, casino buses stopping the, in front of churches, in front of synagogues, being a bad labor, you know. Uh, leave a lot of garbage. They're not supposed to stop there. But there's an enforcement uh, issue, you know. Uh, so how are you guys going to solve it? Because these buses, they don't apply it. Uh, the, the specific location to be at their, their stop. They just go there and pick up, you know, and, and not just one time a day, you know, like three or four or five times a day. So so the label is being uh, very mad of them. And uh, I have a church, a synagogue, uh, they, all, they, they have to pick up their garbage all the time, you know. Uh, it's also causing traffic problem. So I want to like, know how you're going to enforce this. You know, it's a, uh, I will confer with Inspector Harrison about those locations and what the prevailing times are, and we'll give her some assistance out there with that issue. Thank you. Yeah. And our buses that operate a scheduled service between, like, for example, the aqueduct and neighborhood within the city subject to the intercity bus permit system, and if not, does the city regulate them or the placement or or they stopped in any way? So uh, if they're operating entirely within the city of New York, they would not fall under the inner city bus permit regulations. Um, any bus that is making a pickup or drop off at our curb does need uh, approval to do so, aside from, of course, the charters we discussed before. Um, also, if, if it's a regular service that includes payment, that falls under a franchise regulation. Situation. And does the city have an estimate on how many a uh, such company operate and how many trips they provide? Beyond the uh, applications for curbside pickup drop-off that we get, we, we wouldn't have an estimate on the total universe um, that, I, that I can discuss today. We can certainly look into it and get back to you. The city, and the, in terms of franchise buses, so buses that operate pursuant to franchise, we have, there's, the airport shuttles have a franchise with the city of New York. Um, as do, does one commuter bus line in Brooklyn. Do you think that there's some area that they are oversaturated of a buses company, charter buses, that you already have granted pickup and, and drop out permits? I mean, we can certainly review the schedules and the, the sort of frequency of service at the various stops that are permitted um, or approved. Um, and we do so whenever we add a bus or, or renew an application um, to make sure that we're taking into account safety, street width, congestion, all those issues. So uh, we can certainly take a look and, and continue the conversation with you. Okay. I, I you know, listening to my colleague, you know, and I know that those, there's some area that they are more, that they have to deal with this reality in the larger scale than us, than others. And the other thing is, uh, in, uh, we stand together with uh, Council Member Ku and City Controller Stringer uh, the days after uh, the crash that killed those three individuals in, in Northern Boulevard in Queens. What we noticed that day, as we were holding, getting ready to hold the press conference, there was like 10 vehicles that they were stopped in that intersection. Like, how much in this case, and what we heard from other people resident there is that that didn't happen, that doesn't happen often in that particular intersection, enforcement. Like, are you, after the crash in that intersection, do you have another plan on increasing the level of enforcement there as before the crash happened? I can't speak for what the precinct is doing out there, but we were always enforcing speed regulations over there. Just for the simple fact, you have that stretch coming off the overpass from the city field area. So we did enforcement there beforehand, and we increased the enforcement ever since then. Okay. And we what? will continue to go back, even when this comes further and further in the past, we'll still keep going back there. My suggestion, again, on closing is, you know, let's increase enforcement. Enforcement at this level is weak. Uh, 
Yes, the fact again that I just brought the Hobson River Drive, buses going there, and I'm not a NYPD person, I'm just a common citizen, and I assume that the same thing that happened there is happening in other places. Buses getting into area out of the route that they authorize. <laughs> so my message to you is let's work together, let's increase enforcement, let's talk about increasing the penalty to $10,000, to those company and drivers that they do pick up in area that they are not authorized. And I would like to end asking you on what is the message that DOT and NYPD would like to send to the bad actor of the charter buses company. I wanted to make sure that the uh, full enforcement picture was presented to the council. I met Council Member Chim yesterday. We talked about issues on the Lower East Side. So the NYPD handles the enforcement process in the, the beginning. Think of it as the, the first and second batter up to, uh, in the lineup. They issue the summonses. They do the, 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 the street-level enforcement. And part of the process is the people who don't obey. That's where the Department of Finance rolls into the picture. And that process is resolved through the scofflaw process. Many people are unaware that the tickets that are issued by parking violations, they become a form of a court order. That's why the sheriff is involved. So these tickets, and they're quite substantial, get entered as judgments, and the sheriff has a very aggressive pro process. We have a scofflaw patrol throughout the city to enforce the summonses that are issued by the New York City Police Department. And we have very, very large numbers as far as the entire enforcement, and we have a subset involving buses. So last year, for the fiscal year, we seized 115,000 automobiles. That generated 53 million in revenue for the city. Of that subset, 352 were New York State registered buses. Now that's only buses that fall back to New York State registrations, and as discussed, there's a large population that are from out of state. We have an aggressive process where we look for vehicles, including buses, that have excessive judgment debt. We had a particular issue on the Lower East Side concerning one bus company that had hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and we took enforcement action by seizing the buses, as you had requested just a few moments ago that that's the type of enforcement you're looking for. We do carry out that level of enforcement. Once a, a debt threshold goes over $2,500, the sheriff will seize the vehicle. And as the inspector mentioned, it is a very, very costly process because it's a court process and all of the costs associated with the seizure must be borne by the person we seize the property from. So in the particular case in the Lower East Side, we seized a, six buses which generated $250 million in unpaid fines. And I believe that the bus company has been more, has been a, a better actor in your community because of the enforcement we have taken. And just yesterday, we seized another bus for $18,000 in unpaid parking violation. So the Department of Finance is very, very proactive looking for the bad actors in our lane. We don't have the structure that NYPD has. I'll tell you our numbers. We have 12 city marshals and four deputy sheriffs that constantly patrol the city during the business days. And those officers seized 115,000 vehicles last year. That's a significant amount of property to be taken. Make on the effectiveness of increasing the enforcement for you side, if there's an increase or men and women power in your unit? Well, as, as I've been before you before, uh, you've never been shy to say that we're very, very strong in our enforcement efforts. And we will certainly continue with the enforcement. We specifically looked at buses this entire week. The, the population of buses, we scanned hundreds of buses. Many of them had been ticketed before and they paid their violations, and the ones that did not, we seized. And that's the process we're looking for. We have a, a hypersensitivity to this bus issue. We, we, we're looking to, to devote our enforcement strategies towards buses and other commercial motor vehicle traffic that's out there. 
That's long-term plans. Right now, we have a very aggressive program that addresses scoff law. Well, I'm happy to hear those numbers, the 115,000 and the, and the 30, 350. I think that this is something that is New Yorkers, they need to hear. You know, sometimes we cannot do what the federal government is doing right now. Like, I was surprised to hear that the person from the media who is doing the story, she requests in a FOIL the information to the federal government on how many drivers being fined, bus drivers. She said that she had to wait, she was told that she had to wait eight months. And this is not yes a, to elected official, this is not something being told to another average New Yorkers, this is about to the group of individuals who do the job looking for information to educate and inform of that happened. How someone from a mainstream media will be told, you need to wait a month to get those information in the time of technology. Like, and how much of those information does the federal government and DOT and New York City, the New York State Department of, uh, of Transportation share with their city? Do they share some of this information or, or, or they don't have to share the information? Well, from DOT's perspective, we wouldn't get, um, we coordinate with our state and federal partners in a lot of policy ways in terms of specific companies. We leave enforcement up to our partners at PD. So they may have um, some systems. I know that the sheriff has mentioned some systems of how different states communicate with one another and how the city communicates with the state and federal government. Do they share those information with you? What information? Number of, from those bus companies that connect, drop out and pick up in New York City, how many of the drivers who work for those companies get fine tickets every year for different reasons? Not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. So like, you know, my last thing is about what is the message that you want to send? to the charter buses. Not to the good one, the good one, let's keep doing the good, the good job, be a role model, but to those bad actors that every three or four years are part of the problem where we're losing three lives, 15 lives a few years ago, and we don't know how many more lives we will lose in another crash three, four years from now. So I, I think the message is, is that safety is our top priority. And one thing that I just want to underscore, and, and Council Member Chin has, has brought up as well, is that all of the agencies involved in this DOT, the Sheriff's Office, Finance, PD, we're all working together to address many of the issues associated with private buses. And specifically for the PD, as, as Inspector Hanover has mentioned, we have really refocused the mission of the bus unit and that's why I think you're seeing a real increase in moving violations enforcement and parking violation enforcement. And I think that's something that will uh, be continuing as we take uh, a, very, a very comprehensive look at bus enforcement strategy as we uh, enter 2018. To acknowledge that we were also joined before by Councilmember Bramer and Garani yeah. and the last, and, and Councilmember Miller, he has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning to the members of the panel. So um, is, this is difficult because this is an industry that I spent about 30 years of my professional life in, and I know that, that while your testimony says that this is an industry that is highly regulated by the federal government, um, that is just not the case at all. We have seen decades of diminishment of regulations in this industry, which have really contributed to what, we've, what we're seeing now. So if we realistically want to focus on this and be able to address the problems that we see, more, more importantly, as the chair just said, that we are not experiencing the loss of lives every few years, then we need to collaboratively address the realities of this industry uh, and understand that the safety mechanisms that are in place are woefully insufficient and that the city has a responsibility to address 
transportation, all forms of transportation that are operating on the streets of here in New York. And while you say that you aggressively have an aggressive bus unit, I would dismiss that. I would dismiss the fact that this, that these unregulated or often unregulated buses are operating here in the city of New York. They're not the only industries that, that are doing so within the transportation industry. And, and, and so I want to focus on what we can do as a city, considering that we have a lack of authority um, in terms of regulating and authorization of, of these vehicles, because it's quite obvious that those who are operating here, even we just spent a lot of time uh, regulating the commuter van industry and, and, and bringing them up to snuff to make sure that they operate under the same guidelines or close to the guidelines as others that are regulated by TLC and, and, and others, but yet we allow these folks and others to operate on our streets without a, a kind of a, a, a universal standard. How do we get to that standard? And as, as council member also mentioned, what is the collaboration that that we can assure that we are taking unsafe drivers off the street. Now, we know that there is a process that all of these uh, carriers, including the MTA, <clears throat> has to submit affidavits of certification for their operators um, biannually or whatever that, w w whatever that time period is. How do we know how we are coordinating to ensure that we have <clears throat> properly credentialed and certified drivers on the road, what are we doing to ensure to to audit these companies to make sure that the companies are uh, in compliance to whatever we can do? Um, obviously, we don't have the authority to do some of the things that the federal government does, but in terms of coordinating uh, with those agencies that are responsible for putting people on the streets of New York City, including the DMV, quite frankly. Right? The DMV should have this type of information when licenses are revoked for any reason at all, and there should be a centralized database. Um, and, and if we're not aggressively pursuing that, I don't know how do we get to the ends of how we say that we're being safe for someone who continues to be uh, uh, aggressively addressing safety, uh, uh, transportation safety, uh, as a member of the council, and particular this committee here, you know, and, and we've had this dialogue with, with TLC and DOT time and time again, really trying to get our hands around precisely what are we doing to ensure that, that, that these rogue uh, companies are off the road. And I just say that uh, I spent some time in, in, in Councilman Coos district okay. uh, around the area of, of, of Roosevelt and Prince, and, and the folks and the residents of that area are so uh, disappointed that they can't have these buses that are illegally parked there, uh, literally just in rows, uh, removed from there. They, they, they're illegally parked. 10 or 15 at a time, um, they're, they're running, um, they they're, they're actually have their engine running, um, it is congested, it is unsafe, and I can't say that we say that we're aggressively going, and I assure you that if we went down there right now, it's at least 10 buses parked illegally in that location. And so not, that's, that's not the, and that is, mind you, that is less than four blocks from where the accident occurred. What are we doing? specifically that, that, would, that we can take with us to say that we are trying to create a safer environment for, for the residents in New York City. I mean, I can say, Council Member uh, Miller, thanks for the question. Um, on DOT side, we've been working with, with uh, you and other council members at looking at specific areas that do require uh, treatments at, at the curb in terms of dedicating space to try to uh, rationalize the way that the curb and the road are used, and we appreciate the opportunity to continue looking at specific examples that we can try to address through our curb regs, through design, and street improvement projects. Safety is the top priority, uh, and we are dedicated to making sure that all of the existing traffic laws and curb regs are obeyed uh, through education, in some cases, it does involve working with the drivers and with newcomers to the city, especially if they're bringing uh, service from out of state. 
but also through enforcement, through targeted enforcement, and we'll continue to work with our partners at PD and city council members and the community to, to better target enforcement where possible. Clearly the community doesn't want these buses parked outside of their homes, but they're there. How do we not just move, you know, how, how do we allow that to happen? So, and, 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 and I'll let us ponder that, but enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And I know that from a TLC perspective, there are a very limited number of, of, of enforcement uh, officers out there. Um, so it requires for, for PD and, and all the agencies to work collaboratively. But it's been a stretch. It's, it's really been a stretch. Now, in the case of this particular company here, um, not only was the, uh, the, the operator of this vehicle here, Mr. Mung, um, not on their, on their role of certified operators, um, they had themselves not submitted the proper affidavit identifying who their employees were and who were to be on the road. How, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we, as does it require legislation that gives us the authority to say that if you are going to operate within the city of New York, the city of New York has to have some say so in, in who these folks operating these vehicles are. Now, whether or not we, uh, it's, it's the licensing, uh, you know, we, we know that's different. We know that there's, there's the commercial driver's license and, and, and the others that we're not asking to play a role in, but certainly we need to know that everyone who's operating a vehicle uh, within the city of New York, commercial vehicle for profit, that, that they are meeting certain standards. Is there anything in place or is anything by virtue of this latest accident, unfortunate um, um, accident that has propelled us to think along those ways? I think that's a really good question. Um, how, how do we know that, people, that these companies that, that are required to, to submit affidavits to, to at least the DMV have certified drivers on the road? This is our road, These are, this is our city. How do we protect our citizens? Of course, we can't uh, speak to the specifics of, uh, of the, the crash in Flushing right now, given the ongoing NTSB investigation. But in general, we, we do look to work with our state and federal <coughs> partners to uh, understand how, how legislation can be put forward to, to move that along and to get, get a better system in place. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, I, I just say, as, again, I've spent 30 years in the industry, um, and, and, and there's a lot of information available, a lot of research available, and to say that we look forward to, um, we should have been doing that already, and that there are experts in this room, I would suggest that, that we all kind of put our heads together, and whether that means that we formulate some, some actual uh, uh, committees around this, and, uh, but this is certainly something that we don't want to revisit when the next tragedy occurs, saying that we're going to do something. But I, I would submit that everyone in this room certainly has a role to play, um, and because those from the federal government that are responsible for, for really diminishing the type of standards that we here in New York City have are not here and other folks that, that uh, authorizing uh, agencies are not here, it's a little difficult to have this conversation. But what we need to say is what can we do? We understand that this is an industry that is, in comparison, woefully underregulated um, in terms of the responsibilities of the drivers that are on the road. They don't have labor standards that allow them and cause them to spend many, many more hours than the average uh, uh, commercial driver would on the road. So in this, the majority of the accidents in the over the road um, over the past few decades since the industry standards have been diminished have been because of driver fatigue. And, and so how do we seriously address that if these folks are going to be on our road? And mind you that this is a very specific hearing about an industry, but we've had many hearings about transportation uh, alternative industries in this city, and I would submit that we're not 
doing our very best to ensure the safety of, of our passengers. And so I'm, I'm, I'm asking everyone to uh, kind of take that back to, to your principals, and I'm asking the chair that we figure out what it is that we can do collectively to ensure the safety right. of the workers. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, and definitely we will. Uh, I went to the hospital to visit the, one of the family who their wife, she was only aware that her husband was taken to the hospital like uh, 12 hours after the crush happened in Queens. We also know that what happened on the boulevard also took the life away of or you read in the newspaper, a person that the, for the first time he decided to wake up early that day to do exercise. And then a few years ago, there was 14 or 15 people who died in the cross bronze. You know, we cannot wait for the next crash to happen. We agree we don't control many of those rules because they are ruled by the federal government. We do control the pickup and drop out. We do control speeding. We do control buses not to be in area that they're not allowed to be. We do control for company not to use a permit of another company. And I hope that there should be a stronger penalty in those cases. So I even heard that Dahlia was still around these days. And I think that it should alarm all of us for a company with a bad record Adalia to still been doing business around here. So again, we don't, I understand the limitation from the federal and the state, but it is a shame that a bus company that hired drivers with that bad record still is around through Queens and other places, putting the life at risk, not only of the passengers, but of pedestrians. So with that, Thank you for your presentation, and going to be taking like a three minutes break to go to the other hearing, and then be back in three minutes. Thank you. I would like to recognize that we also been jo were joined by Councilmember Levin, oh. Ross, oh. and Greenfield. Three, off there with a three minute break. No, we're going to come back and get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at the podium. Uh, I've been at the podium for Comstock. Yeah. Patrick Conn from Caddy Bus. How are you, Scott? Yes, we have met. I, I, wanted, I didn't want to, uh, I'll talk to Ed Pinker, I'll send you over the copies. I told the Don to Dan, I'm with the Daily News. I just wanted to grab you. He wants a specific. We're not going to have. Well, look. We don't see why you like. We're going to have a. You can't.
Hi, everyone. I would like to... We will take like five or ten more minutes to continue this hearing, so we just have to be voting in the land use matter, but in five or ten minutes, we will get back in section here, okay? Okay. He's coming right back. He asked that you please not start. Yeah. No, no, I had to start. Okay. I told him I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's continue. And if by any chance I had to, you know, stop for two minutes is because I had to go back and vote on the land use. Uh, the next panel is Judy Richin. Richard. Richard. Yes. Andrew Sider. Mark Henry. Jeff Rosenberg. Barry. Thank you. 
Public who so carrots in Tiverted. So nobody else from the public, right? This is the last panel, just in case that I missed someone. Um, I think that yeah. Okay, you can sit down. You may start. We will put the clock in two minutes. Thank you. Sorry. Hello, my name is Judy Richheimer. I'm representing the Guides Association of New York City. I'm the chair of their Government Relations Committee and incidentally uh, signed on to the same bill I'm going to discuss is the Chelsea Reform Democratic Club. Uh, uh, the Guides Association of New York City, known as GANIC, uh, represents professional tour guides in New York. And we're here with my colleague, Andy Sidor. I'm here to first thank you for allowing us to speak and especially for authoring the bill, Intro 1657, which promotes safety on double-decker buses by requiring double-decker bus companies to have live presences, specifically tour guides, on top of the buses. Tour guides on double-decker buses save lives. Example, a tour guide saw that one of his passengers' kids got, uh, the kid got her head stuck in the, uh, uh, the metal bars on top and was able to call down to the bus driver to stop the bus so the kid's head could be ext extricated from those bars. They were about to go through a tunnel or something like that that would have put the kid's head in extreme danger and possibly have been decapitated. Uh, tour guides on top buses are good not only for our visitors, but also for New Yorkers. Example, a tour guide stopped a passenger from throwing a suitcase off the top of the double-decker bus to his friend down below, which could have hit anyone on the street. When I worked on double-decker buses, I managed to pull up, I, I, he must have been a 200, 250 pound man who was jackknife over the side of the railing. So we, uh, should I continue or, no, thank you. Hi, I'm Andy Cedor, and uh, while I'm not currently working on double-decker buses, I did uh, work at, on them for many years and was also uh, for a long time a union representative of tour guides at Gray Line New York Sightseeing that was for Transport Workers Union 225. Uh, again, to reiterate the, um, of the tour guides saving lives, it's also a thing of, of the city's right to regulate. These are buses operating entirely within the city. Uh, and because of that, they are able to prescribe their routes and prescribe their conduct. We already had existing laws uh, banning the driver from giving a tour. Um, what happened was as the technology comes along and the companies are saying we could have recorded tours instead of that, that's not getting given by the driver. And then also arguing we'll put a camera so the driver could see what's on top of the bus. But you got to understand that creates more distraction for the driver. You know, we're talking about problems with bus drivers. Problem of exhaustion is one issue. Problem of distraction is another. And as new technology comes along, we find we have greater distractions. Self, uh, you know, smartphones came out. We had to pass a law saying bus drivers cannot use smartphones while giving a tour. So the idea of letting the technology pick up the slack is not the case. And so what we were pro been proposing uh, is a, really a tweak to already existing law that exists within the city. The city has the authority, the cities use the authority, the authority has stood up legally for decades. But uh, with intro 1657, to basically in, uh, ensure that a driver, uh, that a licensed guide, licensed so the city has tabs on who this person is. 
You know, it's important that it's licensed because the licensing requires that the guy knows things. And for instance, because I have a guide license, I have to know you can't take a bus on the Henry Hudson Parkway. <laughs> I was kind of like, I was stifling myself in the audience there when you were asking that question, because I have to know that. If I'm doing step on guy and I got a bus driver from Alabama, which I still do that kind of stuff, my first question, have you ever driven New York before? And that answer is no. I got to be very prescriptive. I have to do that. I have to make sure he goes on the right roads, both to protect him from getting a ticket, but also to keep things safe and legal. That's something you can only get with a licensed guy, and that's why we need to keep this requirement, that we need to put this requirement where we have that kind of city-regulated personnel on the top of the bus. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jeff Rosenberg with the Amalgamated Transit Union, the international office in Washington, D.C. We represent workers at Greyhound, Peter Pan, and other over-the-road bus companies, as well as uh, several thousand people here at New York City Transit. Um, as Councilmember Chin had stated, the over-the-road bus industry is like the Wild West, no question about it. Um, and with all due respect to the discussion that happened earlier, um, it's not just an enforcement issue here. Um, Mr. Chairman, you were talking about you were asking lots of questions about the number of buses that were pulled over in recent years. I can tell you it's an exercise in futility trying to pull over every bus that you think has a problem here. A uh, national study indicated that there's uh, more than one inspector for every 1,000 bus and truck companies nationwide. It's a game of whack-a-mole. You're not going to be able to snuff out this problem by simply by pulling these buses over. There's much, much deeper issues here. We have buses that are crashing all over the country. The major issue here is fatigue, 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 fatigue. On my, in my testimony, there's a, there's a chart from the National Transportation Safety Board. 36% of over-the-road bus crashes resulting in fatalities over the last 10 years have been a result of fatigue. We know this. It's driver fatigue. Why are the bus drivers falling asleep at the wheel? Several reasons, but the, one of the major reasons is the fact that um, they are exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act's overtime provisions, which 85% of the U.S. population gets as a result of not getting overtime when they go over 40 hours. Bus operators work insane number of hours. By the time they get behind the wheel, they're exhausted. They're working in two or in three other jobs. Not really an issue for this committee here, but the Fair Labor Standards Act is a major issue. The um, overall, uh, we have, a, we have a, an industry which is plagued by um, fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. We have low wages throughout the industry. We know exactly what the problem is. Nobody's addressing the issues. You can certainly push people across to Jersey by, by it, it, it enforcing the laws as the best you can, but all you're going to do is have laws that all you're going to do is have crashes that are occurring over state lines. New Yorkers are going to continue to die, whether it be in New York or North Carolina, wherever it might be. We want to stop the crashes from happening. And thank you. And definitely we'd like to work with you and the, you know, all New Yorkers, especially also those representing the voices of a grassroots community group and also as the unions who represent the workers. I need to excuse myself for another five minutes again. Is that again, we have, we, this being, we are voting in this resorting project, but I've been called that when I get there, I vote and be back, okay?
and turn it on again. Okay. Next person, please. Your turn. Is it on? Right. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez and uh, Council Members, for uh, uh, convening this hearing. We know, you know, we are from. Uh, I'm Christine Berte from Check Pads in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. We have 8,000 bus trips per day, including uh, adding 4, 400 for long distance and about 300 to charter buses parking in our neighborhood. So I think we know something about buses. And two months ago, unfortunately, uh, charter buses drivers killed two cyclists in our neighborhood because they were traveling on an illegal route. And it was very, very emotional. So I think we applaud this initiative and I think we can do better, as you said. First, on safety. I think first and foremost, there is today uh, a safety screening before stops are granted. You know, the Federal Highway Administration Safer Bus Application provides all necessary information to determine whether the driver and equipment are fit for safety. And then uh, currently many are not and they are not being t tested. Subcontractors, uh, 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 Council Member Chin talked about that. And today permits in our neighborhood are given to companies, but the buses and the drivers belong to other companies. And in fact, the companies are charging other company to use the, the stop. So there is a nice little racket going on there. And I think we need to have something in the permit which says the buses and the drivers need to belong or be employed by the company rather than uh, having this loose subcontracting environment. Uh, routes and location. Today, the operators apply for a stop instead of the DOT selecting what stops are good for Vision Zero and for, you know, safety. It should be there for the, re the, the, the contrary. Fatigue. We have uh, a 350 uh, company that want to park in the neighborhood and they don't have any place to park. We need a bus garage to park the buses and have a room where the drivers can rest and can get cool and can be in the good shape for driving again in the evening. And finally, I have other, in, other things, but I want to talk about renewals. And I think we should start with that because we started that process about three years ago and now come the renewals. And the renewal process is not really designed at all. The renewal process should be a one where you check the uh, summonses and where you checked parking tickets, etc. And it should be really designed immediately so that we don't start renewing for three years people which have not been good operators for three years. I'll let you read the rest of it. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, an invited guest. My name is Mark Henry. I'm the president of Local 1056 in Queens, and I represent New York City Transit operators in Southeast Queens where that incident happened in downtown Flushing. Uh, first, my condolences to the family and their lives, and also to applaud the bus operator for saving those individuals on that bus's lives. Um, commuters, taxpayers, and, and visitors in New York do deserve the most safe commute across the city. Uh, illegal vans, uh, dialer style companies, must be regulated. Budget cuts and, and bringing reductions in enforcement cause incidents like this to occur more frequently. It's badly needed that we need a coordinated effort between DOT, TLC, traffic, NYPD, and Department of Motor Vehicles, and, and their presence needs to be also out there in the streets in order to curtail some of these activities. In New York City Transit Authority, and those who, who, who ride buses and subways, we are sent through a battery of testing, a battery of physicals, a battery of recurrent training. There are so many things that has to come into play and should come into play with this type of industry, whether it's the illegal vans trying to eliminate them and get them regulated, or in these dire style companies that need to be regulated as well. These things need to be put in place, and I, I applaud this, you know, I implore on this council to do just that. 
don't just certify that the vehicles can be on the street, but to certify the operators of these vehicles. I think the public deserves that type of public safety. Thank you. No, Council Member Miller has a question. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, so th there is a, a few things. And when you, you uh, I, I caught the end of your testimony, you was talking about renewals. Did you talk about what the current renewal process is? The current approval, you mean? Or renewal? Or renewal. Uh, it's, it's, it's very ill-defined. Uh, there is only that I know when I ask the question of DOT that, uh, you know, uh, buses which have police, uh, which have had police action against them uh, will not be renewed. But it's not codified in any way. And the second thing is that the community input is not taken in, action, in, in, in uh, uh, consideration. So first of all, we know there is not enough enforcement. So most of the people are not going to have a ticket. Then the tickets, the flow of tickets from the police to the DOT is not organized yet. And then there is a question of, you know, what are you going to be not renewed for? Is it a parking ticket? Is it how many tickets? It's, you know, you have to so, define some limits so, probably to be fair. So, so I think this whole process is, is probably rubber stamp. Are they, are they, do, do you know if they certify equipment? Do they certify the operators? What portion of the, the, the no. renewal, the, no. what goes into this renewal? No, okay. it doesn't. Um, Mr. Roseman, could you uh, speak? About all right, I'm sorry, Council Member. So, so sorry, are you, do you still want to take your time? Let me first, I'm sorry, he, he didn't know if he wanted to speak before okay. Council okay. Member Ku was here. So let's give you two minutes, and then we go continue with the questions. Hi, my name is Suksavat, and I'm the Director of Community Affairs at the Free Synagogue of Flushing. Um, my problem stems from the casino buses. Um, one of the services we provide at the synagogue is Gamblers Anonymous. And one day, the casino bus just randomly started parking in front of our, cas of our, our synagogue. And for six months, I mean, I called the, the 109 precinct, I called the, um, the traffic agents to see what they could do. They said they were, they, they were just flip-flopping back and forth. So for six months, I went out and I started taking pictures. There are three license plate numbers, and they were operating for a casino that deems themselves Resort World Casino, New York Casino. But they're using third-party um, third buses to operate their shuttles. Is that legal? Um, that's one of the questions I have. And, and how many tickets per day can be issued per bus? Because these buses operated seven days a week. Fortunately, they left, but they only moved across the street. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm lost as to who is supposed to respond to these types of complaints. You know, I've, the 109 precinct, the traffic agents say I, it's out of my hands. I can just only issue uh, ticket violations. But how much they get them almost every day if they're operating seven days a week. But we can't provide these types of services to the community if <laughs> no one's enforcing the fact that that area is a loading zone. And when a bus doesn't make it there in time, they put orange cones out. I have pictures. I've taken pictures. I had to document this. And then I've taken it to count, uh, Councilman um, Ku's office and worked with his um, uh, director of community relations, Stella Chan, to get it resolved. But still, they've just moved right across the street. Yeah. And, and that's why, uh, you know, the reason why we put this hearing together was a, a, a lot with Council Member Ku bringing to my attention that it was important to hold the hearing because of what happened in his district, not only with Dahlia, but all their behavior, all the companies there. So you heard also from the DOT that the permits, at least the one related to the pickup and drop out, which is the one that the DOT provide, that those permits are not transferable, that no company should allow a second company to use those permits. Yeah. And as you heard, that's one of the factors that they consider, and there's a time for them to 
give another of those permits to those companies. So today's, you know, is a call mm -hmm. it following and pretty sure your suggestion, your frustration that you share with Council Member Cook and what happened also in Northern Boulevard. If yeah, you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Let me finish. May I just continue this in just two minutes? So uh, we, we know about this. You know, you have, like, we, we have been working with DOT and the local prison. Uh, like everyone said, it's just a, a matter of enforcement, right? Yeah, so they can only write so many tickets every day. But if they're there, so we, uh, we still work with them, see what else can we do uh, to like, relocate these buses, yeah. Okay. Councilmember Miller. Yep, and thank you. And, I, and, and Councilman McCool, you had stepped out, but I was talking about our experience as you and I were traveling through the bland houses together and a number of your constituents was concerned and complaining about the number of bus that were, were idling and just running around the building there and what could be done about that. And that has a greater impact, even if they're just sitting, the congestion on, on traffic and on safety as well. So certainly, you know, we want to address that. So. Um, Mr. Rosenberg, so what I wanted to, to, for you to explain was um, so, some of, some of the, the over-the-road regulations and, and, and how they've been diminished over the past decades and the impact that they've had on industry and, and, and safety um, throughout the country and particularly here in New York City if any impact that they've had on some of the accidents, the more egregious accidents that we've seen over the past few years here in the city. And uh, based on those regulations or lack thereof, what would be your, your, your uh, insight on that? I'm, I'm sorry, this was for Mr. Rosenberg. Oh, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that was good to say. I appreciate the question, Council Miller. Uh, Council Member Miller. Um, the long and short of it is that the industry has not been regulated significantly over the last 30 years. There was a major move to deregulate the intercity bus industry, the over-the-road bus industry, back in 1982 by Congress. And ever since then, it has been a, a snowball downhill um, because the, it's been a race to the bottom. It used to be that a bus company wanted to get into business. They had to petition the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is no longer around and they had to get specific permission to uh, get to, to, for, for particular routes, for particular fares that they wanted to charge. Nowadays, since they deregulate the industry, it's, it's you know, you have these two and three mom and pop uh, bus companies all over the country. Um, some of them are quite legitimate, others are not. Um, it's hard to keep an eye on all of them. They, they offer these whopping low fares. The reason they're able to do that is because they pay their operators very little, very little, and the working conditions are horrific. Horrific. We go into detail in, in our testimony. If you are fortunate enough to get a hotel for, uh, as an operator for one of these uh, companies when you're on the road, chances are you're sleeping with bed bugs. And chances are that you're in a place that is not going to give you a lot of rest. These drivers never sleep. They, dr they work two or three jobs when they're not behind the wheel because of the fact that they can't make ends meet. Is there any wonder why these buses keep crashing? So while I totally appreciate what's been the discussion here today as far as regulating Southeast Queens or whatever it might be or on, or on the FDR drive, you know, you're just going to push people over to another place where the accidents are going to continue to happen until we get at the core issues of wages and conditions in the inner city bus industry. We know that when wages increase, that it's going to have a direct impact on safety. We have studies which we cite in our testimony which directly point to that. The truth is that there's a limited amount of things that the city can do, even the state can do. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a federal issue, and Congress just today, we're very pleased that Congress is introducing the, Fair, the um, Driver Fatigue Prevention Act once again. It was previously a bill introduced by Senator Schumer, now it's going to be introduced by Senator Casey uh, in the House, uh, in the Senate, and, and uh, Representative Speer from California in the House, to get at the issues of fatigue in the intercity bus industry by simply allowing drivers to earn overtime like the rest of the population. Uh, but, um, as far as the city is concerned, as far as the state is concerned, there are small things we can do here. You know, you, uh, look, look, there are lessons that can be learned from places like Boston and Washington, D.C., which have curtailed um, curbside bus operations significantly. They, mm -hmm. they use the, you know, the intermodal facilities in, in their cities now when there's not many accidents that are happening in those particular areas compared to here in New York. But ultimately, it's a federal issue, and, and, and I really encourage the council to get 
in a coalition with other cities throughout the eastern seaboard particularly to demand that Congress do something about this issue, to demand that the, the, the drivers be paid appropriately, to demand that the working conditions um, improve, otherwise we're going to continue to see the same problems. We don't have enough resources to pull these buses over here in the city or anywhere else throughout the country. It's just going to continue to happen if you don't stop the drivers from falling asleep at the wheel. Thank you. And, and, and um, Mr. Henry, could you, could you explain um, some of, some of you, you talked about the plethora of, of, of certification regulations and, and recertifications that, and training that happens, that takes place with MTA bus operators. Could you kind of speak to the different, including the amount of hours that you are able to operate over the road as well? Sure. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, we go through a battery of physical tests, sight, hearing, reflexes, uh, and it's a, a 19A standard that's, that's provided by the state and certified to every operator that works for the New York City Trans Transit Authority. Um, in, in that battery of tests, we have to do that periodically, once a year if you're below a certain age, twice, uh, and there's mandatory rechecks involved with that as well. So uh, these operators are, are scrutinized to the nth level that I can that I know of. I've been a part of this process for some 30 odd years, so I know that the, the standards that are done by the Transit Authority are of a high level, and it's something that this industry definitely needs. What might be, what may be some of the instances in which certification or a person would be, that certification would be revoked, not just from a physical standpoint, uh, um, is there anything else that would cause someone to lose their certification or their licenses in this point? And what mechanism is in place to know that a person has lost their license or been decertified or disqualified? Well, under, under the, the 19A certification, say if an individual has uh, a number of infractions, uh, speeding tickets, uh, drunk driving, something of those major uh, uh, incidents, uh, you can be decertified and, and basically pulled off the bus. Uh, but in, and because this is a national database that, that, that with that 19A, someone in another state or another agency would automatically know, is that correct? I'm sorry, repeat your question. Because this is a national database that, that with the 19A certification, they would already automatically know that that CDL has been revoked? Correct. That is, that is absolutely correct. It is a national database. All the uh, operators that work for the Transit Authority are, are filtered through this. Um, and if they have any type of major traffic infraction anywhere in the country, uh, it is driven through this database and they can be removed from service. And does anybody know why that the over the road drivers are not held to the same standards? And, and you did say major, I also know if you have a, a lapse in your insurance that will also disqualify you. <laughs> this, that as, is true as, if as you well. have a lapse. So yeah. Is there any reason why the over the road drivers aren't held to the same standards? Uh, is there any reason why uh, people who ride on buses are not treated with the same amount of respect as people who ride trains or ride in planes? Until any of that changes, we're going to see the same problems happening. And that's the bottom line. It, we have seen a total, um, total looking the other way by the federal government, from one administration to the, not, to the next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I think that it's so great to end this hearing with this panel, because you are bringing those suggestions and concerns, you know, from the union perspective. We know that. You know, there's a difference between those companies that are represented by the unions. You work hard to be sure that your drivers also follow all the rules and regulations. The same thing, someone that represents like a major boss company. We always expect, expect that you continue being the good one in this conversation. And I'm happy to see how the voices after what happened in Council Member Cool District, where those three great hardworking individuals lost their life, you know, immediately brought all the elected officials from Senator Schumer to congressmen, the members of the House of Representatives, the private and the public sector. This is our time for we to learn all the previous experience. And I hope that we can be able to learn what is happening in New York City, in the surrounding area, but also in all the city or municipality or this nation 
and let's see how we can, you know, make those few percentage by actor more comfortable and let's take them out of business. You know, that should be a business. We should uh, encourage the good ones to continue their business. But someone, again, that go out and print a permit or use a permit for another company or a company that allow a second and third one to use the permit to make a small percentage of the profit, the permit should not be re renewed by DOT if we can do it. So thank you, everyone, and let's continue this conversation. Well, with that, this hearing is adjourned. And the next thing that I would do, I'm going to be doing a tour with Council Member Kud through some of those areas too very soon. Thank you.